Right. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, friends, you are welcome to this uh, second Indian Orthopedic Association, Indian Arthroplasty Association uh, webinar on a very interesting topic that is the uh, total knee arthroplasty in valgus knee. Uh, and valgus knee, as we all know, is uh, more difficult to treat. Uh, one, because it is a difficult uh, situation. Usually the deformities are extra articular also. And another reason that we in India are not having uh, the uh, enough number of patients of genovelgum, apart from some patients of rheumatoid arthritis and some cases of uh, primary osteoarthritis. So we'll be discussing in this webinar uh, various uh, very interesting uh, uh, tricks uh, of how to treat it in a safe and uh, uh, reasonable way and how to make your decision so I'm sure that this will be a very useful discussion, uh, especially for our younger colleagues who are starting the arthroplasty in difficult situations. We have very good faculty, which I will request Dr. Uttamgar to, uh, to give the detail after the address of Dr. Ram Chadha. Uh, Dr. Ram uh, will be, uh, is, the for, is the incoming president of Indian Orthopedic Association. Thank you, Dr. Ram, for uh, joining us. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and we'll request you now to uh, say a few words and then start the webinar. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. On behalf of the Indian Orthopedic Association and on behalf of the president of the IOA, Dr. Atul Srivastava, I welcome you all. Uh, it's indeed uh, uh, a coincidence that I have been here for both your webinars, the first one as well as the second. And I am actually a spine surgeon, uh, now by choice, and I would have been an arthroplasty surgeon, as I mentioned last time. It's just that uh, destiny led me elsewhere. And uh, as I said, I can make unhappy people un less unhappy by doing spine surgery, unlike you guys who can make very unhappy people very happy. So I'm so happy that you guys are all together. And you're talking about the valgus knee. For me, in my training days, the valgus knee was only rheumatoid arthritis. We didn't know of anything else. And we looked at it as the rare situation, uncommon because most of the times we saw these short statured women coming into our OPDs, obese with bilateral genu varum, and very rarely did we see, uh, do we see anything in valgus. So I appreciate the effort you're putting in in education and training. And it's a joint venture of the Indian Arthroplasty Association and the IOA. And I welcome you all. I appreciate the efforts put in by the Arthroplasty Chair of the IOA, which is uh, Dr. Ajeev Sharma, as well as the support coming in from the IAA leadership, which includes Dr. Ronan Roy and Dr. Uh, Rajkumar Nateshan. And we have Dr. Uttam Garg, who's here as the webinar convener today. You have an excellent faculty, and I know most of them. There are very dear friends of mine who are all here. And uh, I appreciate that all of you are putting in your time, despite the fact that there's a very interesting cricket match that's going to happen very shortly. So all the best. Have a great time and let's educate each other. Thank you very much for having me. God bless you. Yeah. So, thank you, Dr. Dan. Thank, thank you so you. much for your good words. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Chadda. Uh, so can I uh, share my screen for this introduction? Yeah, sure, sure Uttam. M make it uh, fast and crisp. Yeah, yeah. Is it visible now? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, we can take. Yeah. So, uh, myself, so Uttam Garak from Lucknow, and I will be the coordinator of this uh, webinar. So, Uttam, make it, may, bring it to slideshow, please. Make it full screen, please. Uttam. Yeah. It's fine? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. So, uh, way, 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 uh, our faculty or Dr. Jean uh, Brad, but unfortunately he is not with us due to his personal reason. So we will be missing in this webinar. Uh, another faculty we have, Dr. Rajesh Sharma, he is a chairman of uh, Mulchan Medicity and he is Arthroplasty chairman of Indian Arthroplasty Association as well as Indian Arthroplasty uh, in uh, IOA. Another faculty we have Dr. Manoj Vadwa. He is a light orthopedic institute chairman in Paris Hospital. Recently recognized by World Bank 
वर्ल्ड बुक ऑफ रिकॉर्ड बाई परफॉर्मिंग थ्री थाउजेंड एट हंड्रेड सेवेंटी एट ज्वाइंट प्लेसमेंट इन एयर वेरी गुड कॉन्ग्रेचुलेशन सर थैंक यू अनदर अनदर फैकल्टी वे है डॉक्टर धनशेखर राजा इज अ कंसल्टेंट ज्वाइंट प्लेसमेंट सर्जन फ्रॉम गंगा हाउस फॉर कॉमे टूर इज अ मैनी फेलोशिप अवार्ड इन विद इन ऑस्ट्रेलिया एज वेल इन सिंगापुर Another faculty we have Dr. Abey Allen's from Jodhpur, Ains, Rajasthan. He is a well-known uh, uh, figure in adult reconstruction arthroplasty fellow in Germany. Another speakers we have in the case presented Dr. Mindal from Delhi from Amrita Institute of Medicity, Faridabad. Sorry. Another faculty we have Dr. Nirmal Jado uh, Jadodia from the Durgapur, West Bengal. He has also done his Ranavat Fellowship. Another faculty we have Dr. Rajiv Verma from Manipal Hospital, New Delhi. We have discussion panelist of Dr. Mohanty from Mumbai, Dr. Lakesh Rajput from Calcutta, Dr. Vijay Kumar from New Delhi, Dr. Subhas from Delhi, Dr. Avtar Singh Kambos from Amritsar, Dr. Sanjeev Gupta from Jammu, and Dr. Anil Vora from New Delhi. So all of the faculty, most welcome, sir. See you in this further discussion, right, sir? So I request now further for my first speaker, Dr. Abey Allen's. Sir, you will have to unshare your screen. Yeah, I am doing now, Dr. Abey Allen's. I am just inviting you for the classification of valgus knee and its implications. So can you see my screen, sir? Uh, yes, sir. We can see. Okay. Yes, can see. Yeah. All right. So, good evening, and thank you so much, Dr. Rajiv and the Indian Orthopedic Association, for the invite. My brief today is to speak on the valgus knee, the classi classifications, and what clinical relevance we have from being able to classify these knees. So essentially, the a tibiofemoral angle of more than 10 degrees qualifies as a valgus. About 10% of the total knees that we do will be valgus. So it's not a very common entity when it compares to the quantum of uh, total knees that we do. And uh, overall, world literature essentially speaks of three basic common reasons why uh, the valgus knee is more difficult than the varus one. One, because the surgeons are less familiar. And there's a paucity of soft tissue laterally as compared to that medially. The second is the higher risk of common peroneal nerve palsies, especially the ones with the flexion valgus. There are osseous defects in the lateral femoral condyle as well as in the posterolateral femur and the tibia. And an increased Q angle essentially uh, manifests as an external rotation deformity of the distal femur and proximal tibia, and sometimes because of uh, chronic remodeling changes, which also causes trochlear erosions and lateral subluxations of the patella. So the anatomy of, of the soft tissue that has gone haywire essentially means that there is a tightness of the lateral soft tissue sleeve and an attenuation and a laxity of the medial soft tissue sleeve. And essentially what we are looking at in balancing is that the lateral co collateral ligament and the popliteus will be tight in flexion and extension. The IT band and the posterolateral capsules will be tight only in extension and the popliteofibular ligament is tight only in flexion. So depending upon the kind of deformity we have, one has to look at uh, basically uh, releasing or stretching out these particular ligaments. On the osseous side, essentially there is an asymmetric wear on, and hypoplasia of the posterior condyle of the femur as well as the posterolateral condyle of the femur and the tibia. There may be a, a erosion of the trochlear groove and an asymmetric wear causing maltracking of the patella. And there'll be external tibial torsion and increased tightness of the uh, lateral retinaculum, which is enhanced and exaggerated by the chronic uh, valgus remodeling of the distal femur and the tibia, and even in extra-articular deformities. The pathognotomy essentially is complicated more by the presence of sagittal plane deformities, which means that there could be a, a valgus, a flexion valgus, or a hyperextension valgus. And sometimes these multiplanar deformities have problems associated in the foot, wherein there will be 
hind foot deformities with uh, with or without subtalar subluxation as well as distortion of the midfoot complex and basically what this does to a to a valgus corrected knee is that post total knee arthroplasty sometimes uh, these patients with foot deformities will have residual uh, lateralization of the mechanical axis uh, more than where it belongs and then there will be met metaphyseal valgus remodeling of the femur and tibia uh, uh, because of the chronicity of the problem so if one comes to classify uh, the valgus knees essentially ranavat uh, classifies them based on three important things first is based on the degree of deformity the status of the medial collateral ligament and the amount of lateral release that is required so the type 1 is a minimal deformity where there would be a minimal stretching of the medial soft tissue sleeve type 2 has a substantial deformity of more than 10 degrees and less than 20 degrees these are knees which are associated with bone loss and with stretching and attenuation of the medial collateral ligament and type 3s are the ones where there is a severe deformity there will be associated osseous deficiency and an incompetent uh, or a, or a partially competent uh, medial collateral ligament mulaji and shetty uh, our own dr mulaji has uh, modified this classification and now they have described six types basically on the severity and the correctability of valgus association of sagittal planes and extra articular deformities and the status of the medial collateral ligament so a type 1 according to dr mulaji and dr shetty is a correctable valgus where there is no associated deformity and there would be a medial collateral ligament which is functioning fully well a type 2 is a rigid valgus with no associated deformity with a medial collateral ligament which is intact type 3 and type 4 have the association of sagittal plane deformities where type 3 is associated with a hyperextension deformity and type 4 is associated with a flexion deformity type 5 is where the deformity is so severe the valgus is so severe and it is associated with uh, incompetence of the uh, medial collateral ligament and which is where we start thinking and talking about building in constraint into a total knee arthroplasty implant and type 6 is a valgus with an extra articular deformity and what an extra articular deformity does is that it exaggerates the q angle and it causes a secondary contracture of the lateral retinaculum and the lateral soft tissue sleeve so here is a 55 year old lady who has a correctable valgus uh, on the left side on 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 both sides this lady went in for standard uh, a standard total knee arthroplasty and with standard releases which were very minimal uh, and we were able to get a very good uh, a balanced total knee onto this lady type 2s where you would have uh, a rigid valgus and these are patients essentially where uh, you would require an anteromedial approach you would require to factor in the valgus correction angle and dr mulaji has published on this that there is an inverse association of the valgus correction angle with the severity of the valgus and uh, in the knee and one would need to reduce the marginal osteophytes so pcl may or may not be reduced if you have a stable balanced pcl it is not a must to remove and the posterolateral capsule or the posterior capsule would need some release or some uh, pipe thrusting to get in a balanced uh, extension gap on which to build us a, a flexion gap so this patient had a, a cr knee and eventually did very well type 3 knees are those where one builds in uh, a sagittal plane deformity along with a coronal plane deformity and this was a patient who had a, a valgus hyperextension knee uh, wherein we went in and had to build in uh, a constraint into her total knee implant and she required uh, Uh, her PCL as well to be taken off. Obviously, if we are going to be using a constraint in this case, the next type of valgus is a flexion valgus. These are the most common types. These are the ones which are most commonly associated with the common peroneal nerve injury, and uh, this is where one would really need to to balance out the extension space and then make it rectangular before one can balance the flexion space to the extension space. So this patient. 
had the standard anteromedial approach, had the varus correction angle, valgus correction angle factored into the uh, distal femur jig, had the releases, the standard releases, and in addition to those, we needed an IT band pike thrusting and a PS implant and got a stable, well balanced knee. The type 5 valguses are the severe ones, and this one had a bilateral hip along with all the changes and a very stiff and rigid uh, valgus on both the flexion valgus on both the sides with very minimal range of motion. This patient had undergone a bilateral total hip arthroplasty three to six weeks earlier, and then we were able to do, we, were, we had to do a constrained uh, total knee arthroplasty for him. What we also needed to do was to do a prophylactic fixation with the DFLP just to prevent an interprosthetic fracture uh, because there was a very narrow zone of transition between the Wagner stem and the stem of uh, the total knee implant. And then you would have the type 6 extraarticular deformities wherein uh, there is a secondary additional contracture of the lateral sleeve and the lateral peroneal retinaculum and which would require an appropriate implant and these do extremely well. So the valgus total knee, essentially the implant choice will vary from the degree of valgus and the degree of unstability or instability of the medial collateral ligament. The soft tissue releases is a plethora. It is a complex thing. Everybody has their own go-to method or manual. But by and large, what works mostly, and one has seen what has uh, been advocated by Elkis and, and Ranavat is the inside-out technique which has shown 100% survivorship at 10 years and 83% survivorship at 15 years. And this means balance the extension space after the distal femur and the proximal tibial cut, remove marginal osteophytes, release PCL, do the posterior capsule and posterolateral capsule release. If it is further tight and extension, balance it further with IT band pipe thrusting to maintain continuity of the IT band. Popliteus may or may not require to be released. And once the extension space is, tri is rectangular, uh, then balance the flexion space and take your posterior conda femur cut and have a nice balanced total knee arthroplasty. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Abhay. I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, explanation of the classification of various very difficult types. Uh, Uttam, I think uh, we can take up the discussion after the four talks. Okay, fine. No problem. To, to save the time, yeah, can yeah. you invite, invite the next speaker, please? Okay. So, the next speaker, Dr. Uh, Dr. Nirmal, are you ready? Uh, Dr. Dhan Shikar Raja. Dhan Shikar. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, Dr. Dhan Shikar Raja. Uh, are you ready, sir? I'm ready. I'm ready. Just... Yeah, he will talk on the balancing of the uh, TKR um, by the parapetal approach, lateral parapetal approach. Is it? Just a second, I'll uh, share my screen. The next we will have a Dr. Manoj. Uh, Dana, is it okay we take up Dr. Manoj's talk and then after your talk? Uh, just a second because uh, I need to, I am traveling on the way to Coimbatore. Right. Okay, okay. Right, sure. And then uh, continue my travel. Okay, fine. fine. Sorry for the delay. Suddenly, I'm not able to share my screen. Uh, I checked it before. Yeah. Yeah. Can you switch off your video and then try? Maybe the connection will be yeah. better. Okay. Uh, 
what is the problem is there internet problem so no, suddenly it's not coming up maybe you start the next lecture i will i think so we, we invite uh, dr manoj wadwa uh, to speak on his uh, uh, on his uh, soft tissue release in a difficult valgus knee manoj can you please share your slides my screen is also not coming is something wrong This same like, yeah. Somebody has sabotaged. <laughs> uh, no, no. I think this may be because they we are also uh, live streaming on Ortho TV uh, and uh, uh, IOA TV also. Maybe some soft issue glitch in this. Manu, you are not able to take up your your screen. I again story is coming. My in my share screen. Uh, uh, Nirmal, uh, can you unshare your screen? I think that may be the reason. No, I can get in there. Okay. Yeah, I can get it now. Yeah. Can you see my screen, Ajit? We can see now. Yeah. Okay. So, I shall be taking on soft tissue corrections in a valgus knee. The first thing to start from is uh, the basic point to understand. A valgus is not a mirror image of a various knee, and there are certain protocols. Very very simple. Yeah, I don't know what this means. Sadhin Mitra Ravi Mangal Prasthya. So you have to first analyze whether the bone loss is there or the soft tissue deformity is there. Majority of these cases have this kind of plano valgoid foot. So the foot and ankle guys would say, see these a lot, and their kind of implant they're going to use through. so we have to first see if there is a stiff valgus or is a flexible correctable valgus because that dictates a lot whether you teach with the bone loss is a issue or a soft tissue is an issue once you do an exposure which is the midline you have a choice of going in the lateral parapetal which jana shikhar will show it to you i will be focusing on the medial parapetal which is my work horse in only cases where a tika lateral parapetal is where i have a sublux dislocated patella otherwise majority of these knees i handle through the valgus approach only so the certain i think carry your messages for young arthroplasty surgeons you should always medialize your intermedial rods for a non robotic or a non navigated surgery i always keep a 3 degrees of valgus because i do not want to end up with a hypocorrection of my deformity so whenever you cut this you will have a differential cut you will have a far lesser a lateral condyle because you will have a hypoplastic distal as well as posterior lateral condyle of femur so your tibial alignment goes the same way with the medial to mid third of the tibial tuberosity be very particular about your tibial cut and rotation so slope is an important part i am a cr surgeon and for all these deformities and only do a cr knee all of these knees which are tight in valgus you have to do a pie crusting of the capsule as well as the it band never cut the popliteus or the lcl rotation a very important part just do not take the posterior condylar axis as a benchmark here you have to see about the tibial rotation the white side lines and mainly the trans epicondylar axis your tibial cut and trans epicondylar lines have to be in the paraloid so once you make these cuts you size up your tibia you see your tracking so normally for majority of the grade 1 10 degree 20 this kind of deformity you just spike resting helps you out with a very stable knee with rectangular flexion extension gaps check your stability in mid flexion full flexion and extension and going on to the patella tracking also this is full seating of the patella lying into the sulcus full bending and for majority of these valgoid knees this situation works you might have situations where you have very tight lateral structures spike resting of it band and posterior capsule use a laminar spreader identify the tight bands still you will find many times that you have a medial laxity so tightening of mcl is a tougher part so the better part is go back in and do release with 11 gauge needle your posterior capsule and the it band tightness once you do these structures you will have a rectangular flexion gap well balanced knee flexion and extension a third case where you have these valgus with fft so these are the stiff knees which are a bit out of a tougher situation you have leno valgoid foot and in these cases if you see the kind of deformities are grotesque they would go around 40 degrees of a valgus deformity fmd gets lot connected with uh, anesthesia but if you see the deformity it's huge there is also stretching of the mcl so here i do a very selective medial release just up to the mid corner plane don't go to the posterior lateral corner or posterior medial corner 
Do a selective medial release, sublux the patella, take out the osteophytes, and decompression of the posterior lateral gutter is extremely important. Take off all these osteophytes and all bony pressures that are there. The same rules medialize intramedullary alignment guide by 5 to 10 millimeters with a differential pitch drill. And you will always find a hypoplastic distal lateral condyle. You will hardly have any section on the lateral side. You have distal femoral section in three degrees of pelvis. You normally have a very tight patellofemoral ligament. So release the patellofemoral ligament. And as spoken before, your rotation of the femur is not with the posterior condylar axis, but with a trans condylar axis and tibial cut. So you will have a parallax effect. The another marker to check on your tibial rotation is a uh, femoral rotation is you see a grand penal sign on the top. Again, you have a very hypoplastic posterior lateral condyle as compared to the posterior medial. When you go back, you realize that still you have a lot of flexity on the medial side. So you have to release the tightness on the lateral side. Once that is released, take off the osteophytes stenting the lateral collateral ligament. These osteophytes are taken off. You have to still go back in and see the rectangular flexion extension gaps. If you still have laxities, you will still have to release on the lateral side. So tightening of MCL is a very uh, problematic situation. So releasing the lateral side is a way better answer across in these situations. And I normally do not like adding up the constraints as majority of these knees are the CR knees only. Another problem is the tracking. Still you cite very tight lateral structures and your patellized sublux aiding laterally. So I prefer outside in release, saving the geniculars. Release the tight lateral structures and gradually we'll see your patella will start fitting into the femoral sulcus. On flexion, the patella is sitting very well, you have full flexion achieved. Still one component is left that is external rotation of the tibia because of the tight IT band. So IT band release is done. You identify the tight IT band structures, release the IT band. And now what you have to aim for is balance flexion extension gaps, well seating patella into the femoral sulcus and correction of tibial rotation by a release of the IT band. Once all these things are done, you have a well aligned knee and the patient's walking the same day. So the basic parameter is in all these things, the soft tissue correction would give you majority of the deformity corrections. Uh, Dr. Bariad, we are messing up because he likes a lot of those lateral condylar osteotomies. I can keep it as a very strong backup. And uh, similarly, what my dear friend Dhanushekar is going to show to you on the lateral uh, uh, approach. I use it only in cases where I have already dislocated or subluxated lateral patella. Otherwise, all these parameters are done by a medial parameter approach and almost in 99% of the cases with a CR knee. With this, uh, any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you, Manoj. That's a very uh, more detailed uh, discussion. Uh, and we'll be, we'll be discussing your subject in the, during the discussion time. Uh, Dhana, uh, are you able to come uh, to get your slides? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Yeah, yeah. Please start. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajiv. Uh, uh, good evening, Dr. Ram. Uh, our two IA class presidents, Rajiv and uh, Supran Mohanty, uh, all the faculty. I'm going to talk about a lateral approach to valgus knee. So indication now, almost all my valgus knee has started using this uh, lateral approach because it's more convenient. And once you start doing a particular technique, you're able to do a better job with the uh, own particular technique. So otherwise, generally, I use uh, a lateral approach. We have a surgical valgus more than 10 degrees that we will uh, discuss. Uh, and uh, patients with... Uh, um, lateral subluxation or lateral mall tracking of the petla. So, runaway classification we just now uh, discussed. Um, type 1, type 2 and type 3. Type 1 is a correctable deformity. Type 2 is a fixed deformities with attenuation of medial soft tissues. These are the uh, knees which are amenable for uh, uh, lateral approach and uh, type 3 deformities generally we uh, when the MCL is uh, incompetent we use a uh, standard medial approach the, with a hinge type of uh, joint. Uh, Dhanshekar, we are not able to listen to you. Neither the slides are moving. Okay. 
ஜெனரலிங்கல்ஸ்ரேட்டபிள் but if the deformity is more than 10 degrees tanshekar we are not able to listen to you uh, rajib uh, actually i am able to listen him sir he is very he is clearly audible same. i yeah. guess something with your network i will go ahead and uh, this surgical valgus is what we need to surgically correct the partial uh, correctable deformity we need not address through a lateral approach if the rigid deformity which need to be surgically addressed then we prefer to use a lateral uh, parapetal orthotomy so this is an example where you have a valgus of 25 degrees on a weight bearing or a valgus oh, flex x ray but it corrects to uh, less than 10 degrees of a uh, surgical valgus so this need not be uh, open through a lateral approach okay so this is a video so this is one more example on the image on the left shows a fully correctable deformity the right side is a rigid deformity so the example of one more patient of a severe valgus the valgus is partially correctable but it has patient has more than 10 degrees of fixed valgus which need to be surgically corrected so in that uh, cases lateral approach help you to, helps you to directly address the tight and lateral structures which are the it band and the lateral capsule so this patient you can see the valgus only partially correctable so 15 degrees of residual valgus is there we need to correct at least 10 degrees so that your hip knee mechanical axis is neutral or a tibio femoral angle is in 5 degree valgus so the stress examination and anesthesia so we use a midline skin incision expose the lateral retinaculum up to the tibial tubercle So you open the lateral retinaculum. When you come to the level of the patella, you need to take the entire fat pad with the lateral flap. So you change your blade horizontal, lift the entire fat pad. You can see which will help you to expand the tissues for uh, closure. As we continue the exposure, the insertion of IT band into the Jardis tubercle will be released as a part of the exposure. Now we are releasing the IT band from the Jardis tubercle. we preserve the entire fat pad with the lateral flap for closure because in valgus knee the lateral retinaculum is contracted so when you are closing there is always a tight uh, a lateral closure so once you do the exposure we check how much of the deformity is corrected uh, subluxing the patella medially is going to be difficult sometimes uh, you may need to do a rectus snip so that you can dislocate the patella medially so we use a valgus correction angle measured from the preoperative x ray do the standard distal femoral cut and then doing the tibial cut is a bit tricky because you are approaching from the lateral side always mark the center of the tibial plateau and then you use the extra medullary jig you need to account for the extra articular deformity also which is present in some cases so we do a minimal resection from the uh, medial plateau so now we check the extension gap so laterally is just going in medially it's opening up so you can see the valgus stress medially it's opening now you do the postolateral capsule release which is uh, we keep rotating the tibia internally and then expose the postolateral corner and then you check the gaps again if you're happy with the gaps then you go ahead and finish your uh, uh, further sizing and uh, component rotation but if still if it is tight you measure the gap if it is more than 5 mm difference between the medial and lateral side it cannot be corrected with just soft tissue release because the only tight structure laterally is the uh, lateral collateral ligament and the popliteus so now we mark the uh, now we measure that there is more than 5 mm difference between the medial and lateral gap so now we are using the trans epicondylar axis for rotation because the posterior condyle is hypoplastic so always the condyles are internal rotated we you need to use more external rotation to get your tibial cut parallel to the femoral cut parallel to the tibial cut 
or to restore the proper rotation. So I'm changing the rotation manually so that it will match the transepicondylar axis. And use this block and run out block to check the uh, gaps so that both the gaps are equal in flexion and extension. So it is 5 mm more on the middle side, both in flexion and extension. We complete the cuts, remove the posterior osteophytes. And I always use the PS knee, so it's a notch cut. Again, you can see medially the gap is more. The knee is opening up more medially, laterally is tight. So at this stage, we have released the IT band laterally and the uh, postal lateral capsule completely. So only tight structure is lateral collateral ligament. So if you cannot uh, lengthen the lateral collateral ligament, so I am opting for a lateral epigonal osteotomy. So the distal part of the bone, which is beyond the attachment of the lateral collateral, will be removed and the fragment will be slided down. So that will lengthen the lateral collateral ligament with the popliteus attachment. We can also posteriorize if the flexion is tight. So now we allow the osteotomy fragment to slide down. So you can see how it slides down and the distal portion which is uh, overhanging has to be removed so that the uh, osteotomy fragment will be fixed inside the uh, femoral component. So you provisionally fix with the screw and then do the balancing. You mark the tibial rotation. It's very important when you're using a lateral approach because your rotation, you might tend to external rotate the femoral component. So you need to keep the rotation correctly. This is how it is done. Then you can see how the uh, joint is well balanced. Petla tracking is very good. For a type 3 laterally subplex petla, the automatically this approach forms a lateral retinacular release and helps in petla tracking. So you can easily close the muscle proximally, but as, once you come distally, the closure is going to be difficult. Here we use the fat pad to close the uh, distal part of the orthotomy and it is very waterproof also. Then check the final tracking, the post-operative x-ray, alignment x-ray, uh, comparing pre-operative walking video to the post-operative uh, walking. Patient is around 75 years, retired person, uh, likes to cycle and uh, walk. And the deformity is completely corrected with the lateral approach. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dan Shekhar. Thank you, Dr. Shekhar. Shall now, uh, Dr. Rajiv, are you able to now? Yes, yes, I am. Yeah, yeah, okay. So now I request Dr. Rajiv uh, to share his screen. He will be uh, talking. Uh, uh, am, am I visible? Yeah, visible, but not in sliding yeah. mode. So you need to click on the first slide and go to slide share. Slide share. Sorry. Can you see me now? Sir, your, your slides are visible on a slide sort of view. You need okay. to go on slide show. Uh, is it okay now? Uh, are we able to yes. see? Yes, yes. yes. you can see. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Th th thank you so much, Uttam. Uh, and uh, uh, my apologies that today there has been a lot of issues in the uh, in the communication. Uh, I think it is uh, because we are beaming today's webinar. Uh, through Facebook, uh, YouTube of the IAA, as well as through the Auto TV and IO and IOA TV. So uh, uh, my apologies. I'm sure that next time it will be better. Uh, so I'll be speaking with them on the uh, the uh, severe deformities. How we can work it up by the bony procedures. How to handle the extra articular deformities, which are not uncommon in these situations, or the uh, the constraint implants where you should use the constraint implants. So understanding the valgus knee is very important and steps for correction as we have seen in the talks of Manoj and Dr. Dhanshekar Raja. Uh, we have already discussed about the types of the genovalgum by Abhay. 
cannot go through it the main issues that i'll be i'll be discussing are the components of the deformity intra articular it could be because of the wear of the cartilage and collateral frame contractions and stretching of the convex side or the deformity is extra articular which could be the femur valgum or could be the tibia valgum that is what is to be seen and that's that's how the one of the very important thing is the lateral view of the uh, knee when you see the hypoplastic uh, femoral condyles you will see that both the condyles will superimpose on each other and they'll be looking of the same size that means that lateral uh, lateral condyle is actually hypoplastic which is not an uncommon situation in these these cases the wear uh, that is there uh, the answer is postlateral soft tissue release that you saw in the videos and explanations of anshikar uh, plus the unconstrained knee implant as uh, seen in the previous talks if there is a contracture of the concave tissues uh, lateral postlateral or posterior structures the retraction is due to the inflammatory process adjacent to the worn joint surfaces the plus patient may have a fixed valgus or fixed flexion deformities and the external rotation deformities answer is extensive postlateral soft tissue release but also you have to be ready with the semi constrained implant which is a very important thing or you may opt for adequate lateral soft tissue release lateral epicondyle osteotomy that that you just saw plus the semi constrained implants if you have a elongation of the convex soft tissue mostly occurring with the flexion deformity it may be with the acl rupture or the stretched mcl the answer is very clearly extensive release and fully constrained knee implant like a rotating hinge because these are the cases which may be totally unstable on the medial side because of the absence or the over stretched medial collateral ligament and lastly comes the extra articular deformities which have to be corrected as with the intra articular correction and constrained implant or you can have the metaphyseal osteotomy or the diaphyseal osteotomy as the case may be now posterolateral soft tissue release posterolateral corner you have already seen then how how, how these these structures are are released or they need to be released the iliotibial band manoj has explained very well that the iliotibial band has to be released which is a very very important thing in these these cases which approach to be taken usually people take anteromedial approach lateral approach only in the cases where the where you have a uh, fixed genu valgum or you have to do a tibial to buckle osteotomy these are the cases in my uh, cases which are important to be taken up with the lateral approach if the lcl release is done preserve the popliteus that is a very important thing the release of the popliteo fibular ligament if you have to release do not release the popliteus but the popliteo fibular ligament if you can identify and release it it helps a lot total meniscectomy for the vision free the popliteo fibular ligament laminar spreader in extension and palpate underneath the popliteus tendon then you can you will be able to see that that is the lateral direct lateral release postlateral release that you can do with with a, with a very easy way but remember that the artery is very close about a centimeter away one has to be very careful and be careful that not to over release the lateral collateral ligament because it may create instability in flexion especially if you exercise the postoperative ligament and it requires definitely a constant knee implant some cases as you see that this this patient is having a fixed genu valgum on both the sides operated uh, long back in 2006 we used probably the the ps uh, uh, the pf this probably was the rpf joint uh, with the use of the navigation we can see that the correction is good just by the postlateral soft tissue release you see that how much of the ecchymosis is there that means there has been a lot of soft tissue release in this case and that's what you see the function and this patient's function at a follow up of 2 years where you have a contracture of the concave soft tissues lateral postolateral or posterior structures as we discussed the answer is extensive postolateral soft tissue release and semi constrained knee implant or with a lateral epicondylar osteotomy
The example is this patient with a, a proximal tibial fracture. The, the uh, lap, patella is subluxating laterally. It's a very bad stiffening, significant valgus. Now, in this kind of a case, probably it is it is very wise to be prepared with a constrained knee implant as in this case, and then you will have a good function in this patient. Other patient having the very severe valgus deformity, again a fixed valgus, that's what you, we see here. You see the better to choose a fixed bearing joint than a mobile bearing joint because that will be a far more better approach. Metaphysical osteotomy appropriate in younger patients to bring the femur and tibia neutral. For example, this patient who has a significant valgus and valgus is mostly in the femur. And we see that the uh, uh, lateral epicondylar osteotomy is done and the lateral epicondyle is pushed uh, distally as Dan, Dan Shekhar has explained and then fixed with the screws. Initially, you may fix it up with the, uh, with the K wires. Corrective osteotomy, where and when at the site of malunion is the ideal thing. See this patient having the significant valgus, what we see. Ensure that you have a, for first you have a distal cut, femoral cut, tibial cut, and then see that you are not able to uh, correct it well, then go for a, a lateral epicondylar osteotomy. When you do a lateral epicondylar osteotomy, make sure that this is at least 1.5 centimeter thick so that it is, it is a fixed, uh, it's, a, it's a strong chunk of the bone and then shift it distally as, we, as is seen here in, in this and the, remove the distal part of the, uh, of the uh, lateral epicondyle. Hold it with a, with a hook maybe, fix it with the K wires and then after you can use the fixation with the, uh, with the screws. And that's what you see this patient having a good function. The tibial osteotomy, this is the hypercorrected uh, high tibial osteotomy. What you see here, this patient is, is uh, having the uh, significant valgus. And in this patient, uh, the, if, if we see that if we go for the normal tibial and femoral cuts, what you will, you will end up is having a large amount of gap medially, so which will be a very, very unstable joint. So in this kind of case, either you choose for epicondylar osteotomy or you choose for the tibial osteotomy, which is a better, better method. You cut the tibia, whether with the navigation or with the instruments. And then after, I, my trick is that I make sure that the femur is cut parallel to the tibial, tibial cut. Uh, rather, the tibia is cut parallel to the AP cut of the femur. And then after, you, when you have made the, all the cuts, you can have a fixation, you can assess that what is the level of the osteotomy. And in that time, time you do the osteotomy, uh, keep it incomplete, Complete, ensure that the periosteum is intact on the other side. You can hold it with the with the help of a uh, of a staple uh, temporarily, and then use the you may use the normal PFC sigma kind of implant, and you will have normally have a very good result. What's what what you see here in this patient. Important pointers are: look at the opposite leg, which will tell you uh, what is the best alignment, and also. Always remember that under and over corrected genovalgum have to be avoided. Slight under correction will reduce the need for the release, often limited to the arcuate ligament and better stability and better function. And lastly, uh, I'll request all the uh, listeners, viewers uh, to become the members of the Indian Arthroplasty Association and join us for a better education. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rajiv, for such a wonderful presentation. So now, I think discussion? Yes, any... uh, I, I think that we have a 10-minute discussion on this subject, and then we take up the cases one by one, and the first case will be of Rajiv, Dr. Rajiv Varma. I'll request okay. him to be ready with his slides. Um, uh, Dan you showed a wonderful case of the epicondylar osteotomy. Are you there, Dan uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I'm okay. Here. Right. So, would you like to fix it up? Uh, the one uh, one thing that I want to make clear for younger colleagues is that would you like to temporarily fix it up with the K wires or would you like to fix it up with the uh, with the screw fixation right in the, at the time of the trial implantation? Uh, what I mean to ask you is that would you finally fix the epicondyle 
after the final implantation or at the time of the trial uh, uh, implantation uh, i will temporarily fix it with a screw sir or a k wire whichever is uh, uh, practical because the bone if it is very strong sclerosis then you can put a screw if lost your protic we can put a couple of uh, k wires and then decide where you are going to finally fix the fragment so that you can uh, have a idea about your final insert and everything temporarily fix it then you do a final fixation after you cement it so a final fixation is done after cementing and then you choose your final insert size that is a very good take home point that the final fixation of the epicondyle or the osteotomized segment should be done after the cementing the final implant so that you can fine tune the uh, the stable stability of the knee thank you so much dana uh, uh, yes uttam please uh, yeah uh, can i ask one question to dr uh, danshakar yes sir yes, sir. Mm -hmm. when you deciding a osteotomy so wh what is your take regarding if you are uh, doing a osteotomy of lateral condyle of you are doing a osteotomy of the a uh, femoral epicondyle and then advancing it what do you take for advancing a proximization of the medial uh, uh, medial epicondyle and then put in a smaller uh, spacer or we are doing a uh, lateral epicondyle osteotomy and put in a bigger spacer yes by definitely uh, proximalization of the medial uh, epicondyle is also a described technique yeah I personally uh, uh, seen two failures so i have not attempted that but uh, there is a surgeon from uh, neighboring state who has done more than 30 cases of uh, proximal advancement on the medial side so definitely it can be done but i have seen failures because always the knee is in uh, loading in valgus and this uh, fragment is in distraction so the bone quality is good definitely we can proximalize and fix it uh, dr Ma manoj what is your opinion on this yeah uh, about the about the medial epicondylar osteotomy and tightening medial structures so i think uh, my decision would be very very clear and a message a clause to all youngsters if you have to do an osteotomy prefer a down sliding lateral condylar osteotomy and uh, just refrain yourself from a medial up sliding osteotomy it looks simple but medial up sliding osteotomy is a very very tough part mcl is the only structure you have on the medial side if at all you do something wrong the only choice will be a hinge so if you have to correct on rather than you know um, shortening or imbricating this mcl work only on the lateral side uh, manoj i think you have explained very well that the uh, medial collateral ligament is a far more bigger risk uh, uh, to deal with in the middle epicondylar osteotomy as much as possible one should restrain himself to the lateral epicondylar osteotomy and also one more point i like to mention here then i'll go to manal for his opinion uh, that uh, Should you do the uh, epicondylar osteotomy uh, before the release, the lateral release, or would you decide uh, uh, after the release is done and you are not having the adequate opening up on the lateral structures, then you will decide the lateral epicondylar osteotomy? So the osteotomy is done only after the uh, release of the IT band and the capsule. So right. if you are not able to correct it, then I choose the osteotomy. Second thing I like to answer uh, Dr. Uttam's previous question. so we had uh, two cases one was uh, medial uh, uh, proximalization technique was then it failed it has to be revised uh, second case it was a very well fixed implant and the surgeon from uh, uk did the live surgery in ganga operative course he did a medial reconstruction of the mcl with the semi tendinosis that also failed so medial soft tissue reconstruction is not easy then again proximalization does also does not work So lateral sliding osteotomy is okay, but this also cannot be done beyond the uh, few millimeters of lateralization, because your deciding factor is the distance between the lateral uh, collateral ligament attachment and the distal of distal part of the femoral implant. So if you have to slide more than this, then you have to go for a hinge. So when you're using a hinge, automatically you are uh, reducing the uh, uh, extension gap. You are doing a reduction osteotomy. You are not abnormally lengthening the lateral side so that your common peroneal nerve. palsy does not happen so within the limits of uh, uh, soft tissue release and the sliding osteotomy there can be a good balancing done without a risk of common peroneal pal nerve palsy if the extensive deformity better to straight away go for a hinge with intraarticular shortening so that you don't lengthen and cause common peroneal nerve palsy 
that's an important point uh, that if you have a yes abhay uh, if you have a uh, mcl in ineffic- a inefficient mcl then instead of trying only the osteotomy you have to be ready with the hinge implant i think that's a very important point abhay would you like to say something on this yeah so uh, i think a very important take home to understand here is that the purpose of the lateral epicondylar osteotomy will not be to perfectly give you a uh, a uh, uh, correction of the trapezoidal extension space so it is basically to balance where your knee is is already looking balanced but still the medial side is opening more than the lateral side and there is where uh, you've done all the releases and you just need to distalize uh, the lateral epicondylar uh, the lcl and the and you do a lateral epicondylar osteotomy and you balance the whole thing but if you have still have a trapezoidal space Now that lateral epicondylar osteotomy is not going to do any correction for you there. So you need to balance your knee in extension, and uh, after getting your balanced knee, if you still have uh, uh, an imbalance of the uh, medial and lateral space, or you're not getting isometricity of the two collateral ligaments, that's when you probably decide to do the lateral epicondylar osteotomy. Uh, very right. Uh, uh, the take home is that if you have a MCL deficient knee. then there is no point of trying all these uh, osteotomies or too much of soft tissue release uh, plan for the uh, constraint implant rotating hinge kind of a implant uh, mrinal uh, you have any final comments so, so i think my question was already asked by you uh, whether to do uh, lateral epicondylar osteotomy initially or do the releases and do then do it you know so i would ask a different question from dhanashikra which would be like what degree of flexion would he like to fix his osteotomy so that there is no flexion extension mismatch so hmm. you can answer that so we will that's a very important subject here so we'll do we'll do osteotomy put to your trial spacer and then take the knee to a range of movements it will allow the osteotomy to slide down so when it slides down we mark it in extension what is the position in extension again we take it in flexion and see where is the uh, fragment sitting so we can decide where you want to place it if there is only extension tightness you slide it down distally there is extension and flexion tightness we slide it distally and posteriorly in flexion you see where the fragment is sitting and position that in that uh, same uh, place and then fix with the screw in flexion very difficult to fix with the screw in extension so always fix it in flexion temporary screw and make sure it corresponds the position where it was in extension so you have a imaginary position both in extension and flexion to try to reproduce that but fixation is in flexion only so have you ever seen any mid flexion instability in such uh, you know once you balanced it uh, with the temporary positioning because once you are doing it in flexion extension that point moves yes so but most of the time we leave it little bit tight if you are lengthening too much then you are going to have a fl- mid flexion instability but when you are using your osteotomy always slightly under correct so that the fragment is fixed tight and your lateral collateral ligament is always tight both in flexion and extension so that way you don't develop a mid flexion instability so should you um, renal if you are if you are able to sort of uh, temporarily fix it and then fine tune the fixation where you are going to fix uh, after the implantation the final cementing of the implant then it becomes probably a very easy thing to manage the yes. Uh, the extension gap flexion gap and also the mid flexion gap uh, rajiv uh, you have some question yes, yes or comment yeah. yeah no i just wanted to ask a question because manoj that, you will come to you after rajiv yeah dr abhay has shown that there is a case with a severe valgus and uh, flexion deformity so i just want a tip how to prevent uh, because uh, cp and palsy would be more common in such cases in fixed flexion and valgus deformity so how Any, any tips and tricks to prevent those because i have not done the those complex cases dhan shekhar or manoj uh, or man, or doctor or like to take up yeah. Yeah. or abhay yes so flexion deformity is basically require a posterior clearance normally you have osteophytes treating the pcl once you do that posterior clearance the majority of these fsds do resolve only in a very complex valgoid with flexion there you have fear on these cases of a cpn palsy so there are the cases where you would leave your knee in a bit amount of a flexion on pillows and gradually keep stretching over time but that's only in very severe cases normally for majority the moment you sort of do a posterior clearance on the lateral side that will get rid of your flexion deformities okay 
And, and okay. my experience, Manoj, that if we do, if we avoid stretching the the, the deformity against the deformity, probably that is uh, the best precaution that you can take for to avoid the common peroneal nerve palsy. Yeah, so, uh, uh, have- because the stretching uh, injury is the worst injury. Uh, then, Shekhar, you have any comment on this? So, uh, mild flexion deformity can be corrected the way Dr. Manoj has explained. Do a posterior capsule release, it will automatically get corrected. And severe flexion with severe valgus, we have started doing uh, common peroneal nerve release through a lateral, lateral, posterolateral incision. We have done four cases like that and uh, we are able to release the nerve and uh, reduce the tension. That avoids the common peroneal nerve palsy. Okay. So one quick take is that uh, once you've done your posterolateral capsule, that's what's going to be the posterolateral corner that's going to be tight. So once you've done the posterolateral capsule and the posterior capsule, the next step is probably the IT band. And if after that it is still tight, then probably it just opens up the door to either do a, a, a clearance of the common peroneal nerve at the head of the fibula, or sometimes even you can resect the head of the fibula. And uh, and avoid. But as Dr. Rajiv said, that if you have to stretch to maintain correction, it's better to leave them in slight flexion and stretch them over time. Right. Uh, Vijay, are you there? Pankaj? So, Rajiv, if, if you have any, any comments, Pankaj or Vijay, and then after Manuj. Yes, Manuj, I think they are, they are just joining. Yeah, please. So, so uh, Rajiv, my, this question goes back to Dhanasekar and you, specifically on your experience back to. When we talk about a complex ferrous knee, so today the talk is let's go in for a kinematic alignment, leaving the knee three degrees of ferrous rather than doing an osteotomy. Now, vice versa, Dhanashekar, that you have a knee which is trapezoidal, you have two choices to move through. One is doing a lateral epicondylar osteotomy and second is putting your femur in some amount of an internal rotation where you can still cheat around to balance your patellofemoral dynamics. In which case you would prefer a few degrees of internal rotation and where you would prefer an osteotomy? So if it's a uh, slight valgus, less than 10 degree of surgical valgus, mm-hmm. I'll do these two uh, described techniques. You can slightly put the tibia in the valgus or the femur in slight rotation. So surgical valgus, less than 10 degrees, which can be corrected only by soft tissue release or with some bony correction. So these are the indications for a, a slightly under correction on changing the component rotation. So when the surgical valgus is less than 10 degrees, I always do this technique. I routinely uh, practice what you are describing. Mm-hmm. So, we'll describe technique to avoid the uh, unnecessary soft tissue release and minimal change in component does not affect uh, long term outcome. Uh, I think I would have uh, a uh, very right. Uh, very right. Uh, Manoj, what I prefer is that if you leave uh, some amount of valgus deformity up to three to four degrees, I think it is better to leave in uh, some amount of valgus because this patient has been in this significant valgus deformity for many years. That is one thing. And also leaving at three to four degrees of valgus uh, will also reduce the amount of the release as Dan Shekhar has, ex- has just explained. And I think that is a very, very right way. Rajiv, in our practice, but, uh, when we but, find uh, Please uh, don't leave this uh, obese patients, especially short uh, Indian females who have got obese thighs in valgus because they will not be happy <laughs> have a valgoid knee after the surgery because the thighs will rub against each other while walking. So that is why in short obese females, uh, it is preferable that you achieve a good correction or live neutral rather than leaving a valgus in short uh, uh, Right, Shubran Shu. And also one uh, last thing that uh, many of these patients may have the recurvitum along with. So yeah. One has to be careful and ensure that you, you, uh, you observe it very well on the table if there is a recurvatum deformity, ensure that this is corrected well. Because leaving the valgus and recurvatum both will be very bad, and especially in an obese patient. I think very right. Yes. Manuj, what, uh, what do usually, you say? Usually, rheumatoids are uh, you know, flexion deformity yeah. with valgus, and osteoarthritis are recurvatum with uh, valgus deformity. Hmm. Uh, I think very right. Uh, last and note. I think uh, an, any last comment from the faculty, and then we'll move on to the case presentation. Now, Dr. Rajiv, we'll ask Manuj his opinion. He raised the question. What is yeah, please, opinion? please, Manuj. Yeah. 
In my cases, whenever I find that the uh, patient is osteoporotic and have huge chances of failure of my fixation, those are the cases in which I would prefer to go in for a bit of an interpretation and not take a risk of losing my osteotomy fixation. In all other cases where I have a good bone stock, decent bone stock, and I know that my osteotomy is going to hold well with screws, that's the place where I prefer a lateral condylar osteotomy. And we have to be clear that under correction is like two or three degrees, not yeah. more than. Not more than that. Of course. Of course. I, I, I agree with this. And Dr. Rajiv, so, we'll just we close the discussion. Yeah, yeah Danshikar, please. You've got an excellent case of uh, extra-articular over-corrected valgus, well-corrected with osteotomy. Congratulations on that. Very nicely done. Hmm. Uh, yes, I, I think in these cases, it is better to accept and plan beforehand so that you are very sure that you are not doing the unnecessary releases and you are sure that you are going to do the osteotomy. Thank you so, thank you so much, Danshikar and Manuj uh, and Abhay. Yes. Uh, and we'll now go on to the, we'll close the discussion and we'll go on to the case presentation. And the, in the faculty, Dr. Sanjeev, uh, he's there uh, from Jammu, uh, Mrinal and our all faculty, please participate. Uh, Dr. Rajiv, are, are you going to share your screen? Yeah. Please. Mm. Today we have a uh, small issue with the with yeah. the IT. It seems I can't uh, share it. I don't know. There is some problem. Uh, I think we'll have to do a, a trial uh, sh sharing of the screen with before yeah. uh, IOA TV and Ortho TV. <laughs> maybe maybe that is too much of. Uh, Soft issue, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, software glitches are there. Can you see my screen? No. Uh, no, we don't see at the moment. Mm. Okay. Uh, Nirmal, please re be ready with the, uh, yeah, for the next case. Yes, can present here. Uh, Nirmal, can, uh, if you are ready, can you please come? Uh, okay, Mrinal, uh, finally, we'll, we'll have to request you. Both are not here. I'll sit with Dr. Ashok, a sham of Ortho TV, and try to sort it out for the next time. We can see screen, uh, uh, Mrinal. Make it full screen, Mrinal. Go to the slideshow, right. Yes, we can see it now. Okay, fine. So I'll be presenting a case which would be probably a cakewalk for stalwarts, but a learning message for youngsters. Uh, this is a 66 year female actually. Uh, she came to me in 2016 with bilateral knee pain and she was rheumatoid. And she had this wind sweat deformity. And I advised a total knee replacement, uh, which she did not agree to. And uh, almost six years down the line, she came to me. Uh, it's not moving. Yes, okay now. So this is how she came to me. Suddenly the attendant said that she stopped uh, walking. And uh, she came on a wheelchair to me and this is what she had. So you can see that she's developed a stress fracture in the upper uh, one third of the tibia, junction of upper one third and lower two third. She, you can see the skin condition also. This is how she was when she came. Uh, she had previous surgeries during the childhood. We don't know the detail. There is some uh, bone formation also between the tibia and fibula. And there is a scar mark, uh, puckered scar mark, which is actually adherent to the bone. Uh, so obviously this was a little tough situation for me um, because I could not assess rather my resident who evaluated her also got the stress views done thinking that probably this was a very lax knee and you know th that's why we have those various valgus views here. Uh, so the plan was how to expose because there was previous surgical marks, what cuts to be taken, what are the releases I would need and what kind of implant would be needed because I also have a fracture down there. Yeah, okay, ultimately, so before you before you go ahead, Brunal, can we yeah, go back? Yeah. Can we go back to the uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. 
so in this uh, in the presence of the lateral surgical scar previous surgical scar um, uh, can we ask the faculty that what is this what is the approach that they will prefer uh, manoj would you still take up the uh, the uh, medial parapetalar approach in this case or you will prefer a uh, lateral approach i think he has left manoj left uh, uh, Dhanshekar, uh, what would you, what would be your preference? Shubhranshu. Yeah, yeah, I will see uh, whether the scar is matured or not. If you can pinch the skin and lift the skin away from the subcutaneous tissues, that means the scar is matured and unlikely that you will develop skin problems. But if the scar is uh, not matured, then we can go for a uh, through the same approach. But it is a mature scar, I will still prefer an anterior midline. Yeah. That's, that's a very important take home message, Shubhranshu, that you have given is that if the scar is adhered, then it is better not to touch it. Right? Uh, if right. you have to go for the medial, yeah, Vijay, uh, good that you are yeah, there. Yeah, so, just, yeah, yeah. So, 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 one of the main, you know, here I think you should also have an opinion. Of, okay? And I think I would go by the lateral most. By the lat, I normally do a medial parapetal, but here the scar looks looks quite lateral, and I think it would be difficult to go from the medial side. So you know, there's chance of skin necrosis. So I would maybe err on the side of a lateral sided scar, uh, lateral sided incision with a lateral, lateral parapetal approach in this case. That that brings us to a very interesting point, Vijay. That uh, yeah. when you take a lateral approach in this case. would you just take the lateral approach soft tissue procedure or would you also add it with the tibial tubercle osteotomy because i believe that this patient is having a stiff knee as well yeah yeah if the exposure is difficult then i would have a very low threshold to do a tto right right yeah. Yeah. Uh, and for the for the younger colleagues if you go for the the medial parapetalar incision then you will ensure that the incision is have the two incisions the previous one and the one that you are going to make you should have at least 4 to 5 finger finger distance between the two incisions so that the wound healing is not a problem um, uh, we we go ahead mrunal yeah so so you raised a very valid point dr rajiv this patient also has a patella baha and actually a tibial tubercle osteotomy would do wonders in this case uh, because you will be able to also you know uh, bring the patella up so right. this is uh, what i did and you can see there is a hypertrophied medial uh, side of the quadriceps uh, you know the muscle and the tendon is uh, skewed up you see so i followed the lateral most incision and got it down towards the medial side just above that scar so the hypertrophied uh, vmo or the medial quadriceps was actually excised uh, means the joint was opened through that skewed scar and then i went inside and this is you see the high kind of osteophytes which were there which were actually i couldn't find them on the x-rays itself uh, but uh, mm. they were pretty hypertrophied and the, the, there is a obviously a defect in the tibia you can see and there is the uh, hypoplastic lateral femoral tendon the typical things which which we see in a valgus knee apart from a patella baha so there were a lot of uh, you know i could uh, understand there could be skin problems there could be bony defects there could be a uh, need of a long stem so all these were planned and i went in i did a 3 degree valgus cut did the distal femur first and you know hardly any bone was cut from the lateral femoral condyle as is usually seen now i so, want i had so asked here, me, so here munal before yeah. you go ahead can i ask the faculty that how many of you take the 3 degree valgus in a sort of 5 degree in all the uh, the valgus knees uh, shubhranshu i i always take 3 uh, degree valgus cut in a valgus knee ियलाइजिस normally you you have a scanogram and it is quite medial to where you normally do for a you know, because right. the straight line is quite medial to the to the normal uh, Sh- shubhranshu you agree yeah uh, normally i plan my uh, x-rays beforehand so i right. put the axis to draw the anatomical axis of the femur and uh, wherever it comes out usually in bulgard knee the distal femur is little bulgard and hence uh, the entry point is little medial 
couple right. of millimeters right. medial to the you know very right uh, uh, pankaj are, are you there uh, pankaj valecha yes uh, sir if we go ahead man yeah you are there okay pankaj do you take anything different in these cases where you have a valgus knee and uh, uh you will take up the normal 5 degree valgus uh or, or and, and the entry point as we normally make or you will change the position of the two no sir i fully agree with the comments already made L- uh, yeah. medial entry and 3 uh, degree of uh, very, yes. very right very yes. right uh, mrinal please go ahead it's a very interesting yeah. case so so i had asked for intramedullary uh, cutting jig for the tibia which was not sent uh, so the only option i was left with is either to open it up and put in a small plate and reduce the fracture and then go with my tibial cutting jig extra medullary jig the other option which you know i devised on table was that i used a uh, distal femoral you know entry uh, drill which we have for the tibia and i put in the extra medullary rod through that into the tibial shaft so that reduced my fracture and then i could put in a extra medullary jig and after that i removed that jig and i could do my proximal tibial cut so this was an innovation which i made on table because i did not have i did not want to put in a plate and reduce the fracture especially when it was a acute fracture it would have easily reduced and i checked uh, during the uh, on table with the c arm that i am reaming in the correct direction and i plan to put in a you know a snug fitting tibial stem and i did all the lateral releases as have been proposed in the previous uh, you know uh, by the speakers and ultimately it was so stiff in the valgus that i even had to release the popliteus so uh, uh, mrinal here i'll just make one small comment here if you go we go back to the earlier slide yeah. uh, the when you make it tibial cut and tibial cut is always a problem in these cases where you already have a deformity extra articular deformity or a fracture so one one easy method could be that you make the femur first in these cases in instead of tibia first and then keep the tibial cut parallel to the ap cut of the femur if that is uh, possible uh, it will it will save you a lot of issues of uh, initially fixing it up uh, uh, with, with the with the rod as you have done yeah but it's I a very actually, very good method you have i have seen. actually yeah. done the distal femur cut first but i could hardly cut right. anything from the lateral femoral condyle so i couldn't have that judgment on table and moreover the fracture was acute so it was very mobile so very i thought right. better to stabilize it and then go ahead with this and uh, it did the job for me and uh, this is the final alignment i could get on table in flexion and extension you can see and these were the final x rays immediate post op and almost 3 4 months post op and this is the scar which so, is so you just mentioned that you had to release the popliteus as well yes yeah that, that is a, a interesting point uh, shubhranshu what, what what is your opinion about the release of the popliteus uh, i would rather uh, you know don't touch the popliteus in a valgus knee uh um, because valve that is the only stabilizer on the lateral because side because it is a stabilizer so, right yeah right yeah. that's ah, a very so well, very very good point the posterior yeah. lateral capsule it band etc but uh, popliteus i don't touch uh, in a valgus uh vijay what is your opinion pankaj so generally yeah. i would avo- avoid uh, i also don't want you to be you know ियस Yeah, yeah, because so, this was a very deformed case mandal i i believe and yes, uh, yes. in this uh, uh, extreme situations i think uh, release is okay so in this first picture you can see that the medial side uh, lateral side is very tight even after all the releases i have done the only option why, with me was to either do a sliding epicondyle osteotomy or you know go ahead and try and do the pop, release the popliteus first and then you know ba- try and balance it release so of popliteus what was the itself, final so the release yeah. of popliteus itself opens the joint up to 8 to 10 mm on in, right. uh, in you know once it's very tight then uh, this is the option which is left or you can go ahead with this sliding condyle osteotomy which will bring obviously the popliteus down also right so this is uh, mrinal uh, yeah. at this fracture site did you use the bone graft also because you had the ready bone graft with you 
No, I did not open the fracture site. It was a very acute okay. fracture, just three, two days ago. Uh, that fracture right. had developed, right. and you can see right. it is already healing well. I put it her in terry paratide. She was rheumatoid. Yes. She was osteoporotic. That's why she sustained this stress fracture, and she was walking on it just before two days before. Right, and just for the for the younger colleagues that the when you put this a very well fixed uh, uh, thick stem, but uh, be careful that uh, these kind of patients can have a another fracture uh, in the post operative phase so one has to be careful for that thank so you so much madal certain learning points are there uh, for the youngsters so osteoporosis needs to be taken care of uh, these severe deformities have stress fractures we can use intramedullary tipic uh, tibial cutting jigs and temporarily flip fix the fracture with a small plate and you can use stem extenders to bypass the defect and fluted stems with a hybrid fixation should be used there is a beautiful classification given by dr mulaji published in 2010 which uh, tells you how to deal with acute united and malunited stress fractures with intra with intraarticular or extraarticular deformities and uh, there is a beautiful chapter written by dhan shekra in my book on knee arthroplasty which deals with the uh, total knee arthroplasty with stress fractures so youngsters should read that chapter thank you uh, thank you so much manal i think it's a very uh, uh, good learning case uh, for all of us uh nirmal are, are you ready with your with your case now uh, can you yeah. please share your screen D- then dr. i'll request uh, rajiv to be ready that just uh, just i was just want to one question to dr mennal can yeah. i try sharing yeah, dr yeah, mennal please do it yeah hmm? continue yes, dr uttam in the meantime renal you can ask the you can answer the question of uttam yes dr in this case you have just already released this uh, popliteus tendon so which implant you have chose matlab you know semi constant or unconstant or something like ps or ps cr what whatever i could i could after release i could balance the knee so i did not need to use any constant i used it simple pfc sigma with the stem extension that's it and it was totally balanced you can see on table so right okay. the, the other Renal issue is that you, all all these ca- cases which are the stiff knees uh, they 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 are not so unstable uh, when you when you are uh, releasing the soft tissues so that uh, that scarring itself provide probably some kind of stability yes uh, and neeraj uh, are you sharing your screen please another thing that uh, for not normal normal side okay Yeah, if you're not opening the fracture site, the reamings itself, I you know, provides the graft there at the fracture site. When you ream it, the ream, right. you know, ream the cancellous bone there is the site, and uh, because you're not open the fracture site, so that right provides right. Uh, you know uh, additionally the uh, bone graft at the very fracture right. site. And uh, now, Dr. Nirmal Jajodia we, uh, from Durgapur will be presenting his case of lateral epicondylar osteotomy. Uh, Nirmal, please. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, is everybody able to see and hear me? Yes, sir. We can. Yeah, we can. So, I'm presenting a case of a 54-year-old lady who presented with bilateral knee pains and deformity. The right knee was more painful and deformed. Uh, there was a valgus deformity of 30 degree, and it was not correctable at all with the right knee uh, with a laxity of the MCL and. Uh, it was a, a grade 2 deformity by the classification that we go because there was no tibial uh, uh, osteotomy or tibial defect the range of motion was a 5 degree hyperextension to a 110 degrees of flexion now we know the classification have gone through that so, so want to be delving more into that now this was the uh, the uh, pre operative x ray of the patient where we have about 25 to 30 degree of valgus and this is a stiff valgus uh, there is no correction on varistress and as you can see on the lateral uh, x ray also that there is a lot of uh, hypoplasia of the lateral condyle so just to uh, refresh uh, the structures which are tight in extension we know that the it band and the posterior lateral corner uh, of the capsule when it is tight in flexion it is the contribution from the popliteus and when it's tight both in flexion and extension we have the lateral collateral and epicondylar osteotomy is one of the uh, uh procedures of choice however there is a high rate of instability in the paper by ranawar uh, where they say 24% uh, uh, instability if you uh, choose this as a procedure of the release of the lateral collateral ligament rather than the epicondylar osteotomy 
So the bony release of the epicondyle osteotomy becomes the procedure of choice if you have a knee which is tight both in flexion and extension. Now, uh, to make you understand what happens when we do a uh, epicondyle osteotomy is an interesting chapter in the book uh, of the arthroplasty. Uh, that is the axis of rotation of the tibia on the femoral uh, condyles in the valgus knee. Now, in a situation where the tibia is not deformed, the first distal femoral cut where the femoral is placed, which is perpendicular to the uh, mechanical axis, uh, distalizes the axis of rotation in extension, but doesn't do anything for the axis of rotation in flexion. Hence, you will always have a situation where uh, you would require to uh, ligament balance to balance the collateral ligaments, do something like an epicondylar osteotomy, which distalizes the axis both in the range of flexion and extension, like uh, we were discussing in about, you know, that isometric point of fixation. So, this procedure is helpful when you have a severe deformity in the distal femur and no deformity in the tibia. However, uh, be aware if you choose this procedure for the type C types, the type 3 of Krakos, because when you choose this procedure for the type 3 where there is a tibial deformity, what you are doing is you are distalizing and then you are altering the rotation axis in flexion and in extension. So, uh, instead of choosing an epicondylar osteotomy to balance the type 3 deformities, you should be choosing probably a corrective osteotomy as was shown in one of the you know, previous cases by Dr. Rajiv Sarma. Now, we chose to uh, have in mind that we might require an epicondylar osteotomy in this case because it was a rigid valgus. And how is it done? You get a 3 or 4 millimeter, 5 millimeter slide, you do a distal femoral uh, after your distal femoral and your uh, cuts, your fine finishing cuts are uh, cut there and you maintain a part of the uh, anterior femur and you do a transverse cut and then osteotomize, use your osteotomy to complete and leave the periosteum attached to the epicondyle, uh, to, the, to the fragment. Uh, after you've done that and you've distalized, you fix it and then you shave off the extra bone that might be coming into the way. Now, this is the video of the procedure that this patient required. We did a uh, iliotibial band and a postrolateral corner release in extension, but the knee was still not balanced. At this point, we wanted to assess uh, what is the residual uh, component of uh, deformity by the, uh, the collateral ligament and the popliteus. And when we did the component internal rotation and we uh, chose uh, the web balancing method, we were still having a lot amount of tightness. Hence, hence we decided that the structure which was contributing was the uh, collateral in the IT band, uh, collateral in the uh, popliteus, because there was a tightness both in flexion and in extension. And at that stage in the surgery, we decided to go out with a epicondylar osteotomy. So we have marked uh, the medial most margin of the osteotomy. We won't go to medial to that because we'll end up into the shaft with KOS, and then that is the osteotomy being done. So after you've done the uh, distal cut, you take an osteotome flip it open, it's like a green stick fracture that you create you and then you uh, take some soft tissue and periosteal sleeve left with it. So complete the cut and then flip it back so it still remains slightly attached so that it slides along with this tissue sleeve. And once you have done that, the biggest challenge is to find out what is the isometric point of fixation of this fragment. So uh, after you done then you implant your trial components and then you give your shortest insert which the medial side is accepting and that will gradually stretch the ligaments down, the fragment down distally and posterior. Now here it has gone more posterior than distal. So as we put the uh, trial spacer, we, it still doesn't go in easily. We have to do a bit of struggle and gradually releasing the periosteal attachment and letting it slide further and further posterior and we would be able to get the insert in. And, and, and a good balance at that stage. And that is your point of provisional fixation after you run the knee through a range of motion and find out the point where it lies the best. So after we have inserted with a, uh, uh, yes, that is where the insert starts going in and you get a knee which is in completely balanced in flexion and extension and complete, uh, well aligned mechanically. And that is the point you decide the point of fixation of the lateral epicondyle. So, this is the post-op x-ray where we can see that the fragment has slid 
slightly distally and more significantly posteriorly, the extra amount of bone has been trimmed, trimmed and we could still manage with a primary cruciate retaining knee without any constraint and a well-balanced knee with a good function. So that was the deformity, that is the balance. And that is the post-operative walking video at three months on the patient. The right, the left knee is still due for another surgery, uh, for a surgery. The right knee is completely balanced. There is no thrust and no instability on walking. Thank you, sir. Uh, that's the that's the case. I'll be open for any questions, sir. Uh, th thank you, Nirmal, for a very lucid uh, uh, case presentation. Uh, it was a very good learning point, especially about the epicondylar osteotomy uh, for for. Uh, Beginners, uh, I'll point out again here that the in very osteoporotic bones, one must avoid doing the epicondylar osteotomy uh, because the fragment will be very, very much shattered and will not be able to hold very well with the screws. And if it is done, Dr. Nebel has shown very well that it can, once you do the osteotomy, it can, it can decide itself uh, how much posteriorly it has to shift or distally it has to shift. Uh, uh, that, that, is, that was your message, Nebel, I, I think. Yeah. Uh, any com any comment, uh, Pankaj or Vijay? Uh, Bro, uh, excellent case, Dr. Rajiv. Yeah, excellent case, Dr. Rajiv. I think, you know, the stiff valgus, especially the stiff valgus, you should know osteotomy. And as rightly pointed out, you know, you should be careful in rheumatoid osteoporotic patients. Very, very careful if you, you know. Yeah. Yes, and I agree that uh, uh, Nirmal, well, that you, you have decided beforehand that this patient will need an epicondylar mm -hmm. osteotomy, and I think that is a very right, uh, right approach. And instead of trying to release the lateral collateral ligament uh, almost completely, and then after uh, going to the epicondylar osteotomy. Um, Mrinal, you have any, any point in this? Sir, I think uh, I totally agree with you. For the medial side, uh, we can do the releases and then go for the medial condylar sliding osteotomy. But if there is a fixed valgus, you should initially, if you decide that you have, you would do, you would need probably maybe a valgus of 20, 30 degrees, which is fixed. You will need a sliding condylar osteotomy. Go straight away with that. That is going to make your life pretty easy from the beginning. Very right. uh, can I request Dr. Rajiv to sort of uh, start share your screen yeah, so that uh, uh, will you be able to show your case? Yeah. Can you uh, see? Right. Uh, yeah, put it on the slideshow, please. Yeah. There's a question in the chat box that what is your post operative protocol? Do you change uh, after doing a lateral epicondyla osteotomy? Uh, Nirmal, uh, would you like Nirmal, to answer? Nirmal, what is yeah. Yeah, So there is, there is no change in the protocol. The fragment, uh, because the lateral side is usually sclerotic in the non rheumatoid knees, and you get a good bony uh, fixation. And none of the post-operative rehabilitation changes. We just go regularly standing full weight bearing and allowing the range of motion from the second post-operative day. Uh, but Nirmal, in my cases where I do the epicondylar osteotomy, I give them the knee immobilizer for walking for a period of three weeks as an as a added precaution. I think it's a small precaution. It doesn't harm us in any way. And always the problem happens when the patient is walking in the in extension. Uh, right, uh, Dr. Rajiv Verma, uh, uh, please uh, start your case. Thank you, Dr. Sharma and Dr. Uttam Garg for uh, letting me present a case. I think after all the difficult cases, I'll finish with a very simple case. Because what Dr. Uttam asked me was to do a, uh, if, if you do a lateral parapetal approach, which obviously I was trained. Uh, uh, but, a, but a very important subject, I'm sure. <laughs> and it's a, it's a, uh, I'll start with the case. So this is a 62-year-old, as we have seen until now, a lot of them have got windswept deformities. So the right knee is valgus, but obviously the middle compartment is also destroyed and there are a lot of osteophytes. And the left knee is severe varus. Uh, as these patients come to us a bit late, so this is in the OR. I am checking for the, is it correctable? It is you can see the valgus, but the other side is correctable. The valgus is correctable. It's, a, it's a probably a grade one. Uh, grade one, according to Ranaval's classification, this is a grade one valgus, which is which we see in almost eighty percent of the cases. So I normally use a lera, uh, lateral parapetal approach, which I was uh, trained while working in UK, and we had a lot of uh, Asian patients in Bradford where. 
Our consultants used to do a lateral para patellar approach. So I normally take around three to four finger breaths above the patella and up to the tibial tuberosity distally. But we can increase the incision as we like, or if the deformity is severe, we can increase it. So what the literature tells us and what uh, as our, uh, we have discussed now, once we do the lateral parapetular approach, we actually deal with the deformities itself during our approach and the uh, approach to the joint. So we make an uh, incision releasing the lateral retinaculum, which can release a lot of deformity. And after that, if you see that I have already removed the osteophytes, which is an important part for any varus knee or a valgus knee from the femoral condyle as well as tibial plateau. And then we are um, trying to release iliotibial band from the Gerdes tubercle, which will take care of a lot of our valgus problem in definitely in 80% of our cases. And then we can release the capsule also, lateral and posterior lateral capsule to correct the deformity. So this is, I'm just showing that uh, because once you have got a severe valgus, valgoid knee, then we have to keep the fat pad infrapetular as well as on the lateral side, which helps in closure. In this case, it wasn't that difficult, but I have seen during my uh, registrar years that uh, sometimes we cannot close it without the help of the fat. So this, uh, this is the uh, intraoperative picture with hypoplastic lateral condyle of femur and eroded lateral tibial plateau. There is obviously a uh, lot of erosion in the medial side also. So if you see these cuts, uh, as we have already discussed, there will be very little cut on the lateral side. I also use a trans-epicondylar axis to check my rotation in these cases because of the hypoplastic uh, lateral condyle. So I mark it with a cautery. This is the tibial cut. I took lateral 2 millimeter just to balance the knee. This is uh, trial implantation. And I also, if you see it carefully, I have also marked the tibial rotation uh, with my trial implantation, which has been told by Dr. Sharma and all our uh, faculty. So this was the closure. Sometimes you find it really difficult if in a severe well guard knee. So then at this stage, the fat helps. This I can see that there's no patellar mal tracking and I've got a good range of flexion and extension movement. So this is the post of X-ray. I have used a uh, posterior stabilized knee. So this is this was the, just the one case I, I could take the pictures intraoperatively. This I did, just did around three, four days back. These are the old cases which I have done, but I didn't have the intraoperative pictures. This is the right knee is also similarly severe valgoid knee. And obviously in this, I have used a constrained implant. This was an international patient. Obviously, African patient came late. This is a similar case. So I think with a simple lateral parapetular approach, uh, we can get the correction in simple knees. That is 80% of the cases. So this is a video just to show <laughs> that if we enter the correct space, <laughs> if we take a correct approach and enter the correct space, we can actually see what we want to see and release what we want to release. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Rajiv. I think the last video showed uh, the summary of this whole webinar that you need to know exactly where, where what is the answer for the problem that you are dealing with. Uh, if you don't know the right place, uh, where to do the release, uh, there will be a major issue. Nirmal, you have a question to Dr. Rajiv? Uh, Dr. Rajiv, yes, uh, sir. There, is a, there is a description uh, for the uh, expansion of the lateral uh, arthrotomy by a, by a horizontal Z uh, plastic kind of a thing, the tiblish modification of the lateral approach, uh, so that the soft tissue closure becomes easier. Uh, any experience with that? No, I haven't. I have not done this. I think it's a lateral arthrotomy and coronal plane Z plasty, you mean, isn't it? Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I have yeah, not yeah. used it. Yes, I have not used it. No personal experience. But yeah, it's been described in the books and it is, uh, I think, described uh, 
in 1991 why the person who described i can't remember his name Dr. Kiblish. i think it's a yeah, 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 yeah. approach where you yes. have to it is for the very severe valgus deformity severe valgus deformity uh, yes sir yeah right yes. Uh, the one thing that i'll point out here uh, rajiv that all yeah. these cases where you take the lateral approach uh, uh, one has to be ready that these patients may bleed more yes uh, right uh, and in a stiff knee probably the easy approach is you do it along with the tibial tubercle osteotomy yes the another very important point in all these valgus knees is that uh, you should be ready transepicondylar axis is a very important uh, parameter uh, mm -hmm. and if you should be ready to rotate your femur uh, laterally uh, more than uh, normal in, in many of these cases yes. so one has to be very careful about it yeah. and we have learned very well about the epicondylar osteotomy uh, by various examples given by our all the previous speakers uh, thank you so much uh, everyone and if there is any last comment uh, in this webinar maybe rajiv you can stop sharing your screen yeah i'm just trying to so uh, this is my uh, last uh, uh, any last comment from the uh, from the uh, faculty and then we'll be stopping the live streaming of this uh, this webinar sir so, uh, uh, are you ji uh, yes please uttam ante yeah are you there uttam ante yeah mohan yeah. is there yes yes so what is your take in the uh, valgoid knee uh, in the type 1 and type 2 which approach should be prefer it should be lateral parapatellar or should be medial what is my take for young generation in in grade 1 and 2 grade 1 to it is always medial parapatellar always always medial parapatellar even in grade 3 also i take medial parapatellar approach the lateral parapatellar approach is good to learn as a orthoplasty surgeon but uh, you know it has its own share of complications also it is not that uh, great that uh, <clears throat> one uh, has to practice but uh, most of them uh, most of the 99.9% of valgus knee we can correct it through medial parapatellar approach yeah but okay. also in my my opinion the lateral approach is restricted to those patients where you have a very severe fixed valgus deformity Uh, where you have a previous scar which is laterally placed uh, and you have to you, have, you need to take up the same scar i think these are the two very important indications mrinal you have a comment on this sir i just want to dis i want you to discuss uh, your salient points uh, for recommendation in a valgus with hyperextension the valgus in valgus in hyperextension is a very difficult deformity and one has to be one is that one must recognize Uh, your your knee before you start the bony cuts the one of the very important thing is that you ensure that your your femoral cut the distal femoral cut is uh, is uh, lesser uh, so you cut the less distal femur uh, and ensure that you don't release posteriorly uh, and, and in these cases if you have a slight suspicion you have to have the constraint implant ready in your uh, in your uh, uh, in your operation theater Uh, and also with the extension stem because my feeling is that in the moment the patient is having a unstable knee uh, st uh, stabilizing it with a, with increasing the constraint within the implant will also mean that there will be more stresses at the at the implant bone uh, surface so these patients should always be used with the extend the extension stem uh, whether you use a primary knee primary knee implant or a revision knee implant abhay you have a different opinion on this sir i feel uh, the valgus hyperextensions are the ones which will not be tight so they will always be correctable the right. issue is to balance them so i think the key things here is to minimize your cuts both on the femur and the tibial side that's mm. absolutely primary and once you get a balance and then it is basically a take on whether you want to do so in your, even if you're using a primary implant I would only go up to uh, an extension stem if I feel that because of osteopenia, you know, I want to protect my fixation uh, mm -hmm. or, or any other reason. But uh, the valgus hyperextension is correct. Well, so maybe what we uh, would like all the faculty to 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 express their take home is in cases of the valgus flexion ones, which are the rigid ones and the stiff ones, and those are the ones which even after your correction sometimes you know they will have some corrections left behind and then what do you do for them and those are the ones which you probably have a higher risk for a cpn 
So right. I would like to add and, on something. And, um, right, right, Madam. Yeah. So if we have an hyperextension, probably the stem would be needed if there is an anterior medial defect and you need to build it up because usually you see anterior medial laterally uh, defect laterally in the tibia. Uh, where you might need uh, some kind of augment or uh, probably a tibia, uh, tibial stem, and also in those which would have probably a neuromuscular element, where you might need a constrained implant or a hinge. So those and are and also one very important thing, uh, Mrinal, that you must always give the knee immobilizer in about ten degree flexion for a period of three to four weeks in these cases. Yeah. Because I the posterior that, capsule, yeah, uh, because the posterior capsule, if it is lax. Uh, then it's a, it's a major thing. And if you find that the posterior capsule is lex, which may happen in many of these cases, uh, you you should not, you should ensure that you use a constrained implant in these cases. Sure. Yes, uh, uh, Sir, Rinal, you one, were saying something. One thought process on these situations is that uh, we need to look at them as revision, uh, as we look at the revision scenario. So when you feel your zone one fixation is not going to be enough, you add fixation. And in, in today's times, we have good enough implants where the keel has a good length for us not to worry too much. So if you're adding a, a stem, uh, then you're probably looking at an additional zone 2 fixation. And then you just need to do a hybrid cementation and just cement the proximal part so that you prevent proximal stress shielding as well. You're right. Very important point. Uh, Mrinal, uh, you yes, have sir, any thanks. more point before we close it, uh, close this webinar? Uh, Shubhanshu? Yes, please. But uh, last your last question I would like to ask. Yeah, yeah just, just before that, uh, just uh, in corollary to Abhay's answer, whenever you are adding stem, you have to be careful about the, your uh, base plate position. Sometimes your stem decides your position of your base plate. So if you are giving a good coverage without a stem, and you put the stem, there's a possibility of little overhanging here and there, depending upon the anatomy of the proximal tibia. Mm -hmm. So that is why, uh, if at all you are using the stem, if there's a chances of alteration of position of the tibial best placed, better to use a short cement stem rather than a long stem on cemented one uh, where there will be diaphyseal fixes. Uh, or in these cases, probably offset stem yes. uh, could, could be an option. Yeah. Uttam, your last question, and then we close this webinar. And, and to yourself, <laughs> Dr. Yeah, Rajiv. Please. please. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a valgus near uh, deformity about 20 to 25 degree, in extra articular deformity, what is your opinion regarding correction? Will you like to prefer correctly the intra articulary or will we go for the supracondylar osteotomy? Uh, the, the sequence is in these cases. Uh, first, the identification whether the deformity is in the femur, which is most likely, uh, or the tibia. And yeah. when you when you are sure that you have a deformity in the femur, you do the release, uh, and the release is not going to not enough to control the deformity uh, to to correct the uh, the valgus deformity. In these cases, go for the metaphyseal osteotomy. And metaphyseal osteotomy, supracondylar osteotomy, is a very easy method, unlike what we probably uh, may, may fear about. Be careful in doing this osteotomy. Use the extension stem and, and keep the opposite part of the bone, uh, periosteum, intact. So once you keep the opposite periosteum intact, the osteotomy remains uh, significantly stable. And then using the stem uh, and uh, fixing the implantation is very easy. Yeah, okay. and and you can use the staple, uh, one or two staples, uh, for to fix it temporarily uh, on the table, and then after you may leave the staples there, or you may may just remove. Them. Doctor Mendal, yes. What do you what do you suggest? Any opinion? I think what Dr. Rajiv is saying is uh, perfectly fine. Uh, if you have an extra article deformity going by the Wang's principle, if it's not cutting onto the, uh, if it's cutting into the condyles, then you do enter article correction or you go for extra article. You can do it same stage or you can do it in two stages. That depends upon your. Right. 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 Very right. right. Sir, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, uh, I think this was a very, a very interesting discussion. Very. Uh, very interesting uh, presentations of the uh, of the uh, talk also, as well as the very interesting cases. Uh, excellent participation of the faculty. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, and Puja, now we'll we'll uh, close this uh, uh, live streaming. Uh, Poonam, Poonam, please. Poonam from Ortho TV. 
thank you uh, can can we request you to stop the live streaming thank you so much all and uh, we will be coming up with the 